You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I'm getting ready for my annual Arts Madness Tournament this spring, and I hope you can join in the fun as thousands of listeners from around the world will vote for their favorite artists in a series of head-to-head matches, narrowing the field from 64 down to one ultimate artist. I'm releasing a mini episode of Who Arted every day in January and February so you can learn a little bit about a whole lot of artists. I feel like Who Art Ed. Try to slice it. Who Art Ed? Mr. Wood Art Ed me. Either way, it, it, it's ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. That's off to a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and today we're going to be looking at Jean Michel Basquiat. I remember back when I was in undergrad, the last paper I had to write for my freshman art history survey course was about Basquiat. I'd always been taught that brevity was the key to good writing, and after making all my points, I fell about three pages short of the required length. I ended up padding the paper with multiple block quotes from various books and television characters Anything that seemed like it could vaguely describe Basquiat, even though the original source materials were completely unrelated. When you're about three pages short of the required length two hours before the paper's due, these kinds of tactics feel clever, or at least funny. In hindsight, I think there is something sort of fitting about the collage approach to the story of Basquiat as the artist himself was like tofu, able to soak up and take on so many different flavors. Middle-class child, homeless teen, bankable star of the art world. He was a graffiti artist selling postcards on the street, and a celebrated painter wearing Armani suits to work in his studio. Basquiat inhabited so many different worlds, people can pick the story that resonates with them, because, as he famously said, quote, I'm not a real person. I am a legend. It seems almost an impossible task, but I always like to look for stories that will help to understand the real person behind the legend. With Basquiat, I first learned of him as a graffiti artist turned studio artist. The graffiti work that helped him rise to prominence was a team effort. Basquiat and his friend Al Diaz made humorous, thoughtful, and critical text-based pieces on the walls of Manhattan as a part of an effort they referred to as the SAMO project. In Diaz's telling, when he got to know Basquiat as a teen, it was immediately obvious to him that Jean-Michel was not a graffiti artist. Diaz laughed as he said Basquiat, quote, drew sliding doors in a subway car and put his name in it. Gene the Bohemian. That was his tag. Diaz went on to talk about how in those early days, Basquiat was joyous and loved to laugh. He said, quote, one time our good friend Shannon and I found a garment rack and we started pedaling on it. He took the front, I took the back, and we skateboarded down West Broadway on this thing. A few blocks later, we see a friend Matt, and he jumped on. Then we saw Jean, and he jumped on. We called the thing in mock French, La Machine. The four of us were pumping down the street towards Washington Square Park, and we're all screaming, La Machine, La Machine, until it fell apart a block from the park. And that was it. End quote. He says that they were laughing and just doing whatever came into their heads. They were almost like feral children, just running wild. And he said that's something he got from Jean-Michel. He said that Jean-Michel would get you to loosen up because he only lived once. This playful and adventurous spirit of his youth, it's confirmed by his sisters. In an interview, they talked about how the family grew up middle class in New York. Jean-Michel was a junior member of the museum and encouraged to develop his intellectual side, but he also loved to play pranks. One delightful story they shared was of a block party. Their mother, Matilda, was slicing watermelon, and Jean-Michel told his sister she should swallow the seeds. He convinced her to swallow the seeds because, as he told her, if she swallowed the seeds, her sweat would turn to watermelon juice, so on that hot day, she could refresh herself by simply sticking her tongue out to enjoy the juice as it dripped from her pores. 
Now, we all know that's not how anything works, and yet she did it. I think that was the magic of Basquiat. His creative vision was so vastly different from anyone else. It almost seemed like it came from another planet, and yet it has just enough familiar elements strung together that we had an entry point. We could find our way into his way of seeing things, and even though so much of it seemed chaotic and felt like it shouldn't work, it did. Now, Basquiat's well known to have left home as a teen. He was brilliant, an avid reader, fluent in three languages, but he struggled in high school. His sisters say he would get in trouble largely because he was just bored in school. His father, though, was a striver. His father had come to the U.S. from Haiti and wanted his son to be a success in a traditional, stable career. He wanted Jean-Michel to be a lawyer, a businessman, or something like that, and the two clashed when... Jean-Michel insisted on a different and far more risky path. The common misconception is that Basquiat left home and never went back. After finding success as an artist, his sisters tell how Jean-Michel came home after an exhibition. It was 7 a.m., and they say he looked tired as he pulled up in front of the house in a limo. He rang the front doorbell, and the first words out of his mouth were, Papa, I made it. Basquiat had strong, conflicting emotions. He was strong-willed and left home to pursue his dreams rather than fall in line with someone else's expectations, and yet he felt a strong enough connection to come back for validation and to share his success. Jean-Michel Basquiat was a man who knew his worth and fought for the respect he deserved. When he was 21 years old, just starting to make a name for himself, Basquiat was interviewed for Art New York. The journalist Mark H. Miller was far more established, 36 years old, and he worked to catch Jean-Michel off guard. But as he tells it, Basquiat did his homework and came prepared. He stayed cool but stood his ground with his playful and humorous personality. Miller mentioned a critic calling Basquiat, quote, primal expressionist, and Jean-Michel responded, you mean a primate? Or when Miller asked about working in Anna Nossi's basement, Basquiat said, if I were a white artist, they would say I'm an artist in residence. He asserted himself with a calm demeanor, But his sister said the need to defend himself against demeaning language and racial stereotypes was really hurtful. Basquiat was very much conscious of his place in society and in art history. In a lot of his work, he sought to lift up black culture, portraying figures he admired, like the great jazz musician Charlie Parker, with a crown to show his royal status. Jean-Michel Basquiat actually achieved a sort of royal status himself in the art world, as in 2017, he joined the small group of artists like Picasso, whose work has sold for more than $100 million. Basquiat's Untitled Skull from 1982 sold for $110.5 million, making it the most expensive artwork sold at auction by an American artist. Now, if you want to learn more about Basquiat, I'll link actually two previous episodes I've made about him. One is the full episode I recorded with Todd Lieben back in season two. That was back when everybody was struggling with Zoom school, and Todd was kind enough to sit down and endure even more screen time just to record with me. The second episode I'm going to link in the show notes is a mini episode I recorded about the show that launched Basquiat's career and the Horn Players triptych, which is on the AP Art History list. Now, as always, if you're enjoying the show, please leave a rating or review, tell a friend about it. It has meant a lot to me to see this show grow so much over the years, and I would love to see that keep going.
This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.